Hello everyone and welcome to this new video of Arts of Iron 3. So, surprise, the surprises. What you are seeing here is the historical order of battle for Operation Barbarossa. Why the hell is this? Well, basically because in the, first, in the previous month I was planning to do a kind of video in which I tried to use I tried to use House of Iron Tree to represent the various phases of the Second World War in Europe. And so I started scripting the various historical orders, order of battles for main countries, Germany, Poland, the Soviet Union, Finland, Norway, Denmark, UK, France and Italy. But then I realized that was sucking too much time. I was working alone. I had other, other things to do in real life. And so I gave up with this, but with this project, and instead I've tried to represent in Arts of Iron the way Adolf Hitler and Germany, of course, lost the war by using the historical orders, order of battles. I have analyzed WW2 from sep from 1936 to December 1941. And before you ask me, how did I manage to recreate exactly the various divisions with their historical leaders? Yeah, except some of them. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's simple. I have kept the historical production units in the queue, and I have simply uh, scripted the various order of battles which HQs, for Germany only, because I was playing Germany, which HQs and such divisions with the divisional headquarter and the historical leader. Then, for every single division, I did this job. Transfer units. Eliminate the empty. ta -da. That's it. I've done it. I've done this job for the 1939, the 1940, and of course Operation Barbarossa. Uh, I don't have time to show you the historical order of battle, but um, well, basically these are the forces located in France. Those guys here who are moving are the reserves that Germany planned to transfer on the Eastern Front by July 1941, and here are all the divisions historical divisions deployed. I don't know if maybe the developers of the Black Eyes mode are interested in this, I can give them the whole file and you know to add a bit of challenging in your games try to invade the Soviet Union with this historical order, order of battle you have this limited amount of divisions and you have to try to defeat Stalin <laughs> with these troops but anyway um, now I leave it to the video please uh, this is a message for the English speaking audience. Remember that English is not my first language. I have watched again my video twice. I realized I've made <laughs> an enormous amount of mistakes, so please apologize me. I've done the best. I've done all the best I've I've could. So yeah, that's it. I leave you to the video. I hope you will enjoy it. By the spring of 1945, all what remained of the Third Reich was a besieged Berlin, which years of war have now turned into a pile of burning ruins. How could it happen? What went wrong? In only three years, between 1939 and 1942, the Wehrmacht conquered territories stretching from the Atlantic port of Brest to the river Volga, from the icy Norwegian peaks to the burning sands of northern Libya. Then, in the following three years, the tide of the war turned against Germany. As the Soviets slowly reconquered back Ukraine and Belarus, the Allies landed in Italy and in Western Europe, thus forcing Germany to fight a war on two fronts. In less than one year after the Normandy landings, the war in Europe was over. Many common people still believe that the battles of Stalingrad and Il Alamein marked the turning point of the Second World War, because after those, 
Germany began to accumulate defeat after defeat. Actually, I am not entirely convinced about this line of thought, and this is why, after having consulted many WW2 forums, I came to the conclusion that Germany already lost the war in 1940. The purpose of this video is to show you Hitler's two biggest military mistakes that costed him victory in the Second World War. But before going straight to the action, let me recap the most important moments before the outbreak of the hostilities. In March 1935, Hitler made his first step to disregard the Versailles Treaty by reintroducing military conscription. Then, on March 7, 1936, the Wehrmacht remilitarized the Rhineland, thus violating Articles 42 and 44 of the Versailles Treaty. Two years later, on May 12, 1938, the German 8th Army invaded Austria. It was the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria into the Reich, and, in September of the same year, the Western democracies once more sided with Hitler when he demanded the return to Germany of the Sudeten, a region that was part of Czechoslovakia, but which was densely populated by Germans. Deprived of its most fortified region and virtually surrounded by Germany, the fate of Czechoslovakia has been signed. On March 15, 1939, the troops of the Wehrmacht marched in the direction of Prague, annexing the rest of Bohemia and Moravia. All what remained of Czechoslovakia became a puppet state of Germany, under the lead of Josef Tiso. Then events precipitated. Hitler wanted to solve the Polish question, claiming the Polish corridor and the free city of Danzig in order to reunite Eastern Prussia with Germany. When all the diplomatic efforts failed, he decided to use the brute force, firm firmly convinced that UK and France would have not intervened. So, while the Wehrmacht commanders reluctantly began planning the military operations, the diplomats of half Europe turned their attention to the Eastern giant, the Soviet Union. Stalin, having been excluded from the Munich Treaty, did not trust the Western democracies when they proposed an anti-German coalition. Furthermore, the Polish diplomats refused the Soviet proposal to allow the Red Army to march into Poland in case of a German invasion, fearing that this might have turned into a proper occupation. In that climate of tension, the Germans took the initiative, which culminated in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Officially announced as a non-aggression pact, it also included secret clauses for the invasion of Poland. Initially scheduled for August 26th, it was postponed to September 1st, after having received the news that UK signed a military alliance with its eastern neighbor. For the upcoming operation, codenamed Case White, the Wehrmacht enjoyed a substantial advantage, both qualitative and quantitative. Although there were more than 1 million German soldiers under the arms, only 600,000 grouped in the most trained and best equipped units were deployed on the eastern border. In total, there were 37 infantry, 4 motorized, 1 mountain, 1 cavalry, 4 light and 6 panzer divisions, plus 2 mountain, 2 infantry and 1 panzer divisions held in reserve, and a variety of border garrison and police detachments ready to strike. To defend the western border, the Wehrmacht deployed 33 infantry and 1 Landwehr divisions, plus 4 border garrison detachments and 1 Waffen-SS infantry regiment. In reserve for the Army Group C, there were 11 infantry divisions, poorly trained and lacking any kind of anti-tank weapons. In the east, the German armored forces were divided into two army groups. Army Group North and had under its command the 4th and 3rd Armies. The 4th Army, spearheaded by Guderian's 19th Motorized Corps, was tasked to occupy the Polish corridor and support the attack on Warsaw from the northwest. Von Kuckler's 3rd Army would have instead attacked from the eastern Prussia and would have attacked the Polish capital from the north. Army Group South instead included three armies, of which the 10th was the most powerful. Von Reichenau's 10th Army included three light and two panzer divisions, and its orders were to spearhead the offensive from the Silesia. The 8th Army was tasked to cover von Reichenau's left flank, while the 14th Army would have invaded Poland from the former Czechoslovakia. Furthermore, to support the whole operation, the Luftwaffe deployed about 800 medium bombers, 
340 dive bombers, 520 fighters and 250 transport aircrafts. Luftflotte 1 supported Army Group North and Luftflotte 4 would have done the same with Army Group South. The Polish armed forces were largely inferior in almost every aspect. There were 210,000 men in uniforms, almost three times less than the Germans, divided into 30 divisions, though another 15 reserve divisions could have been raised through national mobilization. On September 1, 1939, the Polish fielded 23 regular infantry and 3 reserve infantry divisions, 8 cavalry, 3 mountain and 1 motorized brigades, divided into 8 armies. Army Detachment Narev covered the front across the river with the same name. The Maudlin Army defended the northern accesses to, the, to Warsaw. The Pomorz Army was stationed in the Polish corridor and was ordered to carry out delaying actions against the German 4th Army. The Poznan Army was stationed in the Poznan salient and was to provide flanking operations against the attacking 8th Army. The Lodz Army covered the approaches to Lodz and filled the gap between the Posen and Krakow armies, the latter forming the main pivot of the Polish defense. The Carpathian army, the weakest of all, defended the mountain passes in the Carpathians. In the second line, acting as a strategic reserve, was the Prusy army. The Polish Air Force, although it had a nominal strength of less than 2,000 aircraft, the total number of operational units were 158 fighters, 84 reconnaissance planes, 114 light and 36 medium bombers. In addition to worsen the overall situation, such models were all obsolete compared to the Messerschmitt BF-109s available to the Luftwaffe. Also, the Polish defensive plan was as obsolete as the Polish Air Force. The Polish High Command explored two possible strategies for the defense. Together with uh, a hypothetical French offensive in the Saar region, the Polish forces should have retreated behind the old Russian fortified line along the Bibrza, Narev, Vistula and San rivers. If from a military point of view this seemed the best solution, it was the worst from the political one. According to this, to this plan, the Germans would have easily advanced into western Poland without too many efforts and would have seized Warsaw without a fight. The only alternative option was to accept battle on the borders, even though this meant to overstretch the already outnumbered divisions along an even longer line. Since most of the manpower for the army came from the western regions of Poland, the adopted plan placed, as I've shown before, the bulk of the Polish divisions along the border, shelling the mobilization forces in the most populous region of western Poland. Fearing a French military intervention, Against the western border, the German plan for the invasion of Poland essentially reflected the Prussian doctrine for of encirclement. The 3rd Army from the north and the 10th Army from the south would have encircled and destroyed the bulk of the Polish forces west of the Vistula and Narev, Narev rivers. The main bulk would have came from the army group south, spearheaded by the Panzers and the Stukas, while from least 14th Army would have launched secondary attack from Slovakia. Speed was the essence of the campaign. In order to avoid a potential war on two fronts, it was imperative for Germany to conclude the offensive in the shortest time possible. The invasion of Poland began around 4 o'clock in the morning of September 1, 1939, when the Luftwaffe bombed the city of Wielun. A few minutes later, the old battleship Schleswig-Holstein began pounding the garrison in the western Platte. At first light, the German troops crossed the Polish border. By September the, the 3rd, as the Pomod's army withdrew from the Polish corridor, Guderian's 90th motorized corps spearheaded the 4th army and managed to officially reunite Germany with Eastern Prussia. In the south, von Reichenau's mobile troops were already beyond the Warta River. By the evening of September the 5th, the Polish military situation was more than critical. The Modlin army was on the verge of collapse and southwest of Warsaw, Von Reichenau's mobile troops broke through the Polish defenses in the Silesia by capturing the key locations of Kils and Piotrkov. Krakow has already been outflanked from the north by von Reichenau's right wing. Exactly one week later since the beginning of the hostilities, on September the 8th, Reinhard 4th Panzer Division reached the outskirts of Warsaw, soon followed by the 1st Panzer, while the light divisions of the 10th Army reached the eastern shore of the Vistula. 
The following day, the remaining of the Prusi army were encircled around Radom and surrendered two days later. As the German army group north was pressing toward Warsaw from the north and the Polish corridor, Pomorz and Poznan armies launched a desperate counterattack to buy some time for the defenders of the capital. Known as the Battle of the Bzura, it caught the Germans by surprise on September the 9th. Despite the initial success, the Polish offensive was halted south of the Bzura River when the Luftwaffe managed to bomb all the bridges across the same river. Furthermore, von Rundstedt ordered the 4th Panzer Division to stop the suicidal attack amongst the well-defended streets of Warsaw and to strike on the flank of General Bortonowski's Poznan army. In the same and following days, the Polish defenses collapsed. In the south, troops of the 14th Army occupied Tarnov and the mobile spearhead reached the River San. In the north, von Falkenau's 21st Army Corps outflanked the Modelin Army from the east and Guderian 19th, 19th Motorized Corps was already marching southward along the Bug River. Brest-Litovsk and its fortress fell to his troops three days later. The situation for the Polish High Command turned from bad to worse on September 17th when the Soviet Union joined the invasion from the east. Organized into the Belarusian and Ukrainian fronts, the poorly organized Red Army mobile troops began a deep sweep into eastern Poland, aided by the almost non-existing resistance. The Poles were caught unprepared and on that day it became clear to Ritz Zmigli that every hope was lost. After having cleared the Bzura pocket, the Germans completely surrounded Warsaw on September 22nd. After having been pounded from the ground and from the air, the Polish capital surrendered to the invaders on September the 27th. Two days later, also the remnants of the Maudlin army capitulated and, by October the 6th, the last pocket of resistance around Koch was wiped out. Although formally the government of never surrendered, Poland ceased to exist as an independent state, having been swallowed by Hitler and Stalin. Before you ask me in a comment, hey man, why the hell did you waste time by talking about the Polish campaign? It was obvious that Germany would have won. Well, in my opinion, it was not so obvious. For the first nine days of the campaign, the Wehrmacht High Command was worried about a possible French action on the western border, and as a consequence, it was reluctant to let the Panzer divisions attack deep into Poland. The more they advanced in the east, the more it would have been hard to redeploy them to the west. The French, however, did practically nothing. Both Western democracies declared war upon Germany on September the 3rd, but neither Britain nor France had developed plans for an offensive against Germany. The French mobilization was low and to make things worse, the overall French strategy was focused on the defense. The French high command felt much safer behind the Maginot line, so why abandon such heavily fortified positions to invade the, the Ruhr? The French were presented with a unique opportunity to end the war even before the end of the month, but they missed the chance, and in the following year they would have paid heavily such mistake. If the French inactivity prevented Germany from losing the war in the first month, the Soviet intervention helped Germany in ending the campaign without running out of ammunition and combat vehicles. The fanatical Polish resistance, mainly during the Battle of the Bzura and during the Siege of Warsaw, reduced the ammunition supplies more than the Germans anticipated. In the aerial bombing of the capital, for instance, the Luftwaffe consumed half of the available bomb supplies, and by the beginning of October there were enough supplies for only two more weeks of war. Then the German pilots could spend their time in playing rummy, as General Erard Milk warned. When the guns fell silent in occupied Poland, the war moved from Europe to Scandinavia. After the Polish campaign, Stalin feared a German attack in the Baltic and thought to get control of such important region. The Soviets gained military access through Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania and began negotiations with Finland about the moving of the current border. On October 14, 1939, the Moscow government made his, his request. Along with some islands, they wanted the lease of Hanko Peninsula in order to set up heavy coastal guns to control the gates of the Gulf of Finland. Furthermore, they wished to correct the Karelian border near Leningrad, complaining that the town could have been easily bombed by enemy artillery. In exchange, the Soviet Union offered the munis municipalities of Ripola and Porajopi for a total surface of 5,463 square kilometers of new Finnish territories against 2,729 
which would have been acquired by the Soviet Union. Had the Helsinki government accepted the Soviet request, this would have been the new geopolitical situation. But the Helsinki government, despite being favorable on almost all the proposals, was irremovable about the lease of the Hanko Peninsula. Tensions between Finland and the Soviet Union began to rise and culminated with the, in the shelling of Ma Manila on November 26, 1939. Soviet artillery shot seven shells against the border village, but Foreign Minister Molotov accused the Finnish of having opened fire without any reason. Four days later, Soviet troops crossed the Finnish border, marking the beginning of the Winter War. To defend their homeland, the Finnish forces consisted of 350,000 men, organized in the following order of battle. The Army of the Isthmus, which included six divisions guarding the Mannerheim Line. The 4th Army Corps, composed of two divisions, and was lo which was located north of Lake La Ladoga. And lastly, the North Finland Group, which consisted of a handful of independent battalions with small support de detachments, tasked of defending the border stretching from Sala up to Petsamo. On the contrary, the Soviets had, at the beginning of, of the conflict, 500,000 men, 105,000 tanks and 3,000 airplanes, organized in four armies, for a total of 21 divisions. The 7th Army, later reinforced with the, with the 13th Army, was facing the Karelian Isthmus, and it, its objective wo was the city of Vipuri. The 8th Army, deployed north of Lake Ladoga, was to advance north of that lake, attacking the Manraim line from behind and link up with the 7th Army. Further north was, locate was located the 9th Army, which was tasked of reaching the Gulf of Bothnia, thus cutting Finland in two. At the northernmost section of the front there was the 14th Army, whose task was to capture the Arctic port of Petsamo and block all the land communications between Finland and Norway. The Soviets achieved a crushing superiority over the Finnish army, 3 to 1 in manpower, 80 to 1 in tanks, 5 to 1 in artillery and 5.5 and to 1 in aircraft. Once again you might ask me in a comment, hey Theo, why the hell are you talking about the Winter War? Germany was not involved in, in the conflict. Yes, I know, this is perfectly true. During the Winter War, mainly the Soviet Union and Finland were involved. Germany at that time was too busy in reorganizing the armament industry to increase the ammunition output. The initial heavy losses suffered by the Red Army, however, stunned the entire world, and the Pyrrhic victory did not help the Soviet Union to mask the humiliation suffered in 105 days of war. The poor combat performance of the Red Army reinforced in Hitler the conviction that it would have been possible to defeat the Soviet Union. Moreover, this would have had tremendous consequences in the planning of Operation Barbarossa. The Winter War brought Europe's attention to Scandinavia. To make a long story short, Hitler feared that the Royal Navy could set up a naval blockade to die in Germany of the precious iron ore coming from neutral Sweden. For once, his fears were correct, as the Allied planned to land an invasion force in Narvik to close the railway to Sweden, thus interrupting one of the most important supply lines for the German war industry. For a matter of pure coincidence, the Germans won the race against time, and on April 9, 1940, they launched Operation Exercise Weser, the codename invasion of Denmark and Norway. Thanks to the surprise effect and to the use of the airborne troops, the Germans managed to land troops in Oslo, Kristiansand, Bergen, Stavanger and Narvik. Under many aspects, the campaign in Scandinavia was a brilliant success of the Germans. Not only did they manage to divert the Allied attentions away from what would have become the main theater of war, but also the Germans troops involved in Operation Exercise Weser did not hamper the preparations for the invasion of the West. The loss of 10 destroyers at Narvik, however, was a severe blow to the Kriegsmarine, which definitively made impossible any German attempt to conduct a successful invasion of England. At dawn of May 10, 1940, the Wehrmacht crossed the Belgian and Dutch border, sanctioning the end of the Phony War and the beginning of the boldest operation ever planned so far. At the time of the German aggression, the Allied enjoyed a numerical superiority almost everywhere. 
excluding the exaggerated ratio on the sea, the Western democracies fielded 151 divisions against 135 Germans and had 4,204 available tanks and of superior quality against 2,439 panzers. In the air, the Allied had 4,469 operational aircrafts versus 3,500 and 78 available to the Luftwaffe. Nevertheless, despite this quantitative and qualitative gap, the Wehrmacht achieved one of the most spectacular success in the history of warfare, followed by the first great military mistake made by the German High Command. On May 10, 1940, the French National Army was organized into three army groups. The first army group included the 7th 1st, 2nd and 9th armies and would have been directly involved in the opening phases of the campaign. The 2nd and 3rd army groups, with the other 4 armies, defended the Maginot Line. An Alpine army with 5 divisions guarded the mountain passes linking France to Italy. One motorized, two colonial, two North African, two Alpine and four infantry divisions were allocated to the General Reserve. Here, Due to the game engine limitations, the British Expeditionary Force has been added under control of the 1st Army Group, although in our timeline it fought as an independent formation. However, even the most ignorant person in military affairs can glimpse the seed of the defeat. 33 divisions guarding the Maginot Line were simply too many, considering that such units faced only 17 German divisions. But then, why did the French focus so much on the defense? Well, it's very simple, because they suffered the victor syndrome. The generals of the French High Command believed that the same strategies used to win the Great War would have worked again in a future conflict. Forcing the enemy to bleed to death his manpower against strongly fortified positions and forcing him to fight a war of attrition was the essence of the French strategy. The French war plan, codenamed the Deal Plan, can be considered as an extension of the Maginot Line into Belgium by exploiting the natural bar barriers offered by the local geography. In case of a German aggression, the French 1st Army Group would have occupied Belgium and established a defensive line behind the, the Deal River. In the meantime, the Belgian Army would have fought a series of delaying actions to allow the Allied troops to arrive and begin. Without knowing it, the Allied strategists would have acted exactly as expected by the Germans. On the other side of the hill, the final plan for the campaign in the West can be summarized in the following lines. German Army Group B with the 6th and 18th Armies and 29 Divisions had to advance into Holland and Northern Belgium, inducing the Allied intelligence that these would have been the main thrust of the German offensive. Army Group A, instead with 45 divisions, would have attacked through the Ardennes. It included the 4th, 12th and 16th armies and would have been spearheaded by Panzer Group von Kleist, an ad hoc mobile formation that comprised 7 Panzer and 3 motorized divisions. Furthermore, after the initial breakthrough, it would have been reinforced with the 3rd and 4th Panzer divisions. The plan was simply crazy. Von Kleist's panzers had to rush across the Ardennes forest and cross the Mersey River at Sedan within only four days. After having established a bridgehead, they were to turn west and reach the English Channel, to cut away from every mean of supply the Allied armies fighting in Belgium. The plan looked like an adventure. The fate of the Third Reich was to depend on the outcome of one single operation. Yet this was the only available option to the Germans to overcome the combined power of UK and France in a quick campaign. Germany already experienced a four-year war of attrition and the Schlieffen plan proved to be inadequate to succeed in that goal. Germany needed something crazy with, with which to shock their western enemies and Manstein's plan proved to be so crazy that only a few generals in the Wehrmacht High Command initially believed in it. The war in the west began with a spectacular airborne operation over Holland. The targets for the paratroopers were the bridges over the Mars and the airfield of Rotterdam, clearing the way for the infantry of the advancing 18th Army. 
Another small Ebon detachment attacked the fort of Iban Emel, considered the strongest fortification ever built by the Belgians. Attacking with support of the Stukas and with the effect of the surprise, they seized most of the bridges of the Arbor Canal and on the following day, the columns of the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions linked the paratroopers with the infantry of the advancing 6th Army. The Allied High Commands were caught in the trap. Having received reports about Luftwaffe bombing and airborne drops over Holland, they believed that the main German assault would have descended from the north northeast through Holland and Belgium, and reacted as a consequence. As the divisions of Army Group B were fighting their way through Holland and Belgium, and as the French 7th Army and the British Expeditionary Force were marching to, to meet the invaders, von Rundstedt Army Group A was silently advancing to the Ardennes Forest. Spearheaded by Guderian's 19th Motorized Corps, Panzer Group von Kleist resembled an endless grey rolling snake crawling on the few available roads. Had the Allied Air Force discovered such inviting target, not only the German would have lost the surprise effect, but also any aerial bombing would have severely hampered the armored thrust. Within three days since the beginning of the offensive and facing enormous logistics difficulties, Guderian's Panzers reached the Mose in front of Sedan, while Rommel's 7th Panzer Division did the same at Dinan. On, the, on that very same day, small infantry detachments took control of the few bridges over the Meuse and secured a bridgehead. In the night, pioneers completed the construction of the military bridge and on the following day, the 1st and 2nd Panzer Divisions crossed the natural obstacle and reinforced the bridgehead. May the 14th was the most decisive day of the whole campaign, not so much because the French armored counterattacks against Sedan failed, but because Guderian deliberately disobeyed his superior's orders, which stated that Sedan Bridget was to be held by the Panzers until the motorized infantry had arrived to secure it. The father of the Blitzkrieg, having personally observed the confusion raging amongst the enemy ranks, he ordered the tanks of the 1st and 2nd Panzer Division divisions to advance toward Rethel, about 40 kilometers west of Sedan, right on time, when the Panzers reached the hills west of Chemery, they met the French reserves moving in towards Sedan. The, the terrain of the battlefield, however, strongly favored the defenders. With the French counterattacks failed and the road open, the Panzers charged in the hostile land at an astonishing speed and, at 7 p.m. of May the 20th, the re reconnaissance battalion of the 2nd Panzer Division reached the English Channel at Abbeville. Confusion and discussions between the Allied High Command further reduced the possibility of a coordinated counterattack along the overextended flank of Army Group A. As the Panzers were rolling toward the channel, the Allies wasted three precious days in organizing the counteroffensive, which materialized on May 21st, south of Overa. The British Trust, however, did not launched by the British. It did not have any effect on the timetable of Army Group A, with the help of the 88mm anti-aircraft guns and with the rapid response of the Stukas, the British tanks were first checked and then forced to retreat to the starting positions. In the following days, Guderian rushed his units forward. The 2nd Panzer Division invested Boulogne on May the 22nd. The 10th Panzer Division attacked Calais the following day, while the 1st Panzer Division was marching at full speed toward Dunkirk. And it was here that the Germans made their first big strategic mistake, which would have cost them the final victory. Dunkirk on May the 24th was practically defenseless. Forward elements of the 1st Panzer Division already crossed the AA Canal, the last natural obstacle standing before Dunkirk. The Allied troops were still fighting the infantry of Army Group B and they had no chance of being quickly redeployed and respond to the growing threat on their rear. More than half a million English and French soldiers were about to be caught in the trap and only a miracle could have saved them. And the miracle came in the shape as in the infamous HALT order. Surprisingly, the order did not come from Hitler but from von Brunstedt. On May the 23rd, von Kleist, whose Panzer Group has been put under the command of the 4th Army, communicated that his group was no more able to mount successful attacks to the east due to the enormous losses suffered in 14 days of operations. 
Although this message was discarded at the army I command, it had a profound effect on von Kluge, commander-in-chief of the 4th Army. Talking with von Rustedt, he su suggested holding the Kleist Panzer Group on his left wing to allow the infantry on the right wing to close up. Von Rundstedt agreed, issuing a temporary halt order for the following day, May the 24th. The following day, however, Hitler visited von Rundstedt HQ and, after having received news about the development of the situation, he shared the same pessimistic view of the Army Group A commander. The known Panzer generals, overwhelmed by the flank psychosis, prevailed, and at 12.45 the order came out of HQ of Army Group A. Hitler's decision not to revoke or amend the von Rusted order proved fatal. To make a long story short, thanks to the interception and decryption of the Enigma machine encoded messages, Lord Gord discovered the German plan and prepared the defenses. Furthermore, Bad weather and the appearance over the battlefields of the Supermarine Spitfire prevented the Luftwaffe from turning, Dunkirk, from turning the Dunkirk evacuation into a massacre. When the Wehrmacht High Command realized the mistake, it was already too late. By June the 4th, when the soldiers of the 18th Army entered the ruins of Dunkirk, more than 300,000 Allied soldiers have been evacuated. At Dunkirk, Hitler virtually lost the war. Such huge rescue operation was enough to boost the British morale and Churchill's popularity. The success of Operation Dynamo, mixed with the speeches of hope of the British Prime Minister, meant that Great Britain would have fought on until either Germany or UK would have been defeated. Confident that eventually the US would have joined the, the Allied cause, all what he needed was time. Time to build up the necessary resources needed to win the giant war of attrition against Germany, and events proved he was perfectly right. On the other hand, had Guderian Spencer's occupied Dunkirk on May the 24th, history would have taken a much, a much different path. Just like the, the defeat in Norway, which led to the dismission of Neville Chamberlain, the hypothetical disaster of Dunkirk would have had much more profound consequences. Not only Churchill pos Churchill's position would have been weakened, but, it, but, it, but it is also very likely that great, great Britain would have been forced to sign an armistice with Germany. Without having to worry about any possible Allied invasion of France, the Wehrmacht could have unleashed her potential. The Wehrmacht could have unleashed all its potential against the Soviet Union. And yes. I'm sure you will agree with me if I will say that the other big and fatal mistake Hitler did was to invade Russia. Carolus Rex of Sweden tried and failed, Napoleon Bonaparte tried and failed, would have Hitler succeeded in this titanic struggle? Obviously not. Operation Barbarossa was doomed to fail even before its beginning, since the entire operation was based on assumptions rather than on realistic figures. The lack of an intelligence network in Russia forced the planners of Operation Barbarossa to use inaccurate or outdated information. For instance, the Germans severely underestimated the strength of the Red Army, as well as the industrial potential and the replacement capabilities of the Soviet Union. For instance, between June and December 1941, the Germans transferred to the Eastern Front only 20 infantry and 2 panzer divisions, while the Soviets moved to the front line almost 10 times as many troops. Furthermore, the Germans approached Operation Barbarossa in a completely wrong way. While against France the Wehrmacht High Command feared a long war of attrition, in the war against Russia the higher military ranks believed that the campaign would have, would have lasted no more than 6 weeks. Another important deficiency that affected the Germans was a lack of an adequate logistics system. On one hand, the planners of the operation simply did not take into account that, that Russia lacked the modern infrastructures which were present in Western Europe. Furthermore, the Russian guard was likely wider than the European standard. The Germans hoped to capture a large amount of Russian trains and wagons, but when this did not occur, the efforts put on the German railway system 
rose to an insane level. On the other hand, the German further complicated the situation by fielding a very heterogeneous army. By the launch of, of Barbarossa, some 2,000 different vehicles were in service, and this meant that an even larger amount of spare parts was to be stocked and distributed. The fact that mostly denied a German victory in 1941 was the excessive delay with which Operation Barbarossa was launched. Planned to begin on May the 15th, 1941, it was delayed until June the 22nd, a delay of 38 days, more than 5 weeks, which proved to be catastrophic. Many still believe that the German invasion of Yugoslavia and Greece was the main reason behind this delay. Well, I don't completely believe in this, because of the 33 divisions involved in the Balkan campaign, 10 were Panzers, 2 motorized, 2 light, 3 mountain, and 15 were infantry. There were also 2 motorized SS regiments and the Gross Deutschland motorized regiment. By the end of May, however, all the combat divisions that fought in Yugoslavia were already en route back on the eastern border and would have been ready within the first week of June. For those that fought in Greece, it was all a, ma a different matter, since combat losses were higher and the inhospitable, inhospitable terrain took a much greater toll on the German panzers. Therefore, the 2nd and 5th panzer divisions only appeared on the battlefield when Operation Barbarossa already begun. <coughs> Considering, however, that the main effort was to be made in the center and most of the units coming back from the, Bal coming back from the Balkans would have ended in the south, the Balkan thesis begins to crumble. Even if Mussolini did, did not attack Greece and generated the chain of events that culminated in the Balkan campaign, Operation Barbarossa would have been delayed anyway because of the excep exceptional weather. The winter of 1940-1941 was particularly severe and such conditions combined with, combined with late thawing of the eastern European rivers, late melting of snow and prolonged spring rains contributed to keep rivers flooded until late May. If rivers had appeared as, n as natural obstacles in the path of a Blitzkrieg advancing Panzer Division, a flooded river valley would have been an almost unsurmountable obstacle. Had the Germans invaded Russia without delay, instead of the Blitzkrieg they would have experienced the Mud Creek. So in conclusion, had the Germans invaded Russia around early June, maybe, and I will say again, maybe they could have managed to reach and conquer Moscow before the end of the year. And before analyzing the main phases of Operation Barbarossa, let's clear, let's clear another misconception. The fall of Moscow would have not triggered the collapse of the Soviet Union, as many people still believe today. The Soviet government would have been redeployed to Kibyshev and could have continued the war from there. The fall of such an important town, however, would have had a severe impact on the Soviet railway transportation, since all the main railway lines passed through Moscow. Despite such unsolved deficiencies, the Germans attacked anyway. At dawn of June 22, 1941, more than 3 million German soldiers, 600,000 lorries, 3,000 tanks, 7,000 between guns and mortars, and supported by more than 3,000 planes, invaded the Soviet Union. Within one week, by June the 29th, the Blitzkrieg once more ruled supreme in the East while in the south von Rundstedt met fierce resistance in crushing the Soviet defensive lines, in the north Oepner 4th Panzer Group blazed through Lithuania and crossed the Daugava River at Vinsk and Jakobstadt. In the center, Hoth's Panzer Group from the north and Guderian's one from the south crossed the Bug River 
and met 325 kilometers behind the Russian lines, closing the pocket around Minsk. The Belarusian capital already fell on June the 28th, occupied by troops of the 20th Panzer Division. By July the 10th, Army Group Center has cleared the Belistok Minsk pocket, collecting almost 290,000 men, 2,500 guns, 1,500 captured or destroyed tanks, and almost 300 planes. As the infantry was clearing the pocket, Panzer groups bypassed the Dvina and the Dnieper rivers, occupied Vitebsk, and were prone to attack in the Smolensk corridor. Although in the northern sector, Höpner's 4th Panzer Group once more advanced at an astonishing speed, von Lieb's infantry armies began facing the first difficulties. Von Kuckler's 18th Army failed to encircle and destroy the Soviet 8th Army, while Bush 16th Army had some serious problems in maintaining contact with the neighboring 9th Army. Also in the south, von Rundstedt armies broke through in the Ukraine after having faced a harsh resistance, spearheaded by von Kleist's 1st Panzer Group, which by that date almost reached Zitomir, the first target before Kiev. On July the 10th, the battle for Smolensk began. Within five days, hot from the north and Guderian from the south, almost closed another pocket around Smolensk, trapping 15 enemy divisions. The next day, Smolensk fell to the invaders, but, for the first time, the Soviet reacted by launching a series of desperate but well-coordinated counterattacks along the entire Smolensk sector. Furthermore, as Guderian's panzer, panzers were rushing toward Yelnya, Soviet forces began fleeing eastward in the gap between the 2nd and 3rd Panzer groups. Only on July the 27th the pocket was closed and by August the 5th the remnants of three Soviet armies were completely wiped out. In the same time, as von Kugler's 18th Army slowly advanced toward Tallinn in, in Estonia, von Kleist in the south was ordered to divert his forces south to Uman in order to trap the retreating Red Army troops. The maneuver was another brill brilliant success, and by August the 8th, all the resistance has ceased to exist. At this point of the campaign, however, a significant divergence emerged between Hitler and his generals. Guderian, confident that after Smolensk the, the next goal would have been Moscow, ordered the 268th Infantry Division, the 2nd SS das, das Reich, Motorized Regiment and the 10th Panzer Division to cross the Desna River and establish a bridgehead all around the Yelna Heights. On every map, the Yelna salient appeared as the springboard for the upcoming offensive against Moscow, but Hitler, who initially believed that the Soviet Union would have been defeated in a matter of weeks, was becoming more and more anxious when faced with the sad reality. The increasing and unexpected difficulties faced by von Kruzet's Army Group South led him to alter the original directive of Operation Barbarossa. In a series of discussion with the OKW, the Wehrmacht High Command, and as well as the frontline commanders, Hitler reached a compromise on August the 9th. It was decided that the bulk of the Soviet forces was facing Army Group Center, and that the most important objectives were the destruction of such forces and the occupation of Moscow. But it was also agreed that the enemy troops deployed on the flanks of Army Group Center posed a considerable threat. In conclusion, the attack against Moscow had to be preceded by small operations on the flank of Army Group Center. The discussion went on, but on August the, the, on August the 21st, Hitler confirmed his orders. Army Group Center would have been deprived of its two Panzer Groups and would have assumed defensive positions. The occupation of Moscow before winter no longer had the highest priority. The objectives were the conquest of Leningrad in the north and the elimination of the Soviet 5th Army operating in the Kiev salient in the south. Alia Yakta Est On August 24th, Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group, spearheaded by, model, by Model's 3rd Panzer Division, began the attack southward. By September the 10th, after having repulsed improvised Soviet counterattacks, Guderian's Panzers occupied Romney, while von Kleist massively reinforced the Kremenchuk bridgehead constituted on August the 20th. 
in the following four days as the Germans surrounded Re Leningrad f from the south, elements of the 3rd Panzer Division from the north met the vanguard of the 16th Panzer Division coming from the south at Lokovica, officially closing the Kiev pocket. By September the 26th, all the fighting inside the pocket ceased, and one of the biggest encirclement and annihilation battles of the human history ended. The Germans captured more than 600,000 Soviet soldiers, about 800 tanks and 3,000 guns. Many historians drastically condemned Hitler's decision to divert Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group to the south instead of allowing von Bock to resume the attack against Moscow. Yet, from a military point of view, his decision proved to be brilliant. The 44 divisions available to the southwestern front still posed a great threat to the Army Group's center's right flank, and had von Bock attacked against Moscow in late August, it is highly probable that Budjeni's southwestern front would have launched a series of counterattacks against the German Second Army. And even if the Soviets lacked the coordination and mobility to launch such attacks, then they would have dug in behind the Dnieper River. This not only would have prevented von Russian from capturing Kiev, but would have tremendously extended the front line, forcing the Germans to commit even more divisions on the Eastern Front to consolidate their holdings. With the collapse of the Kiev bulge, not only the threat on von Bock's right flank has been neutralized, but Army Group South had now the road open to advance in the Ukraine and in the region of the, of the Donbass. By early September, when it was clear that, that the trap was about to, to, to be closed east of Kiev, Hitler considered shifting the Eastern Front to a defensive stance, once Army Group South had overrun the rest of the Ukraine. According to him, Moscow could have been taken in 1942 and Leningrad could have been taken by starvation. Autumn was at the gates and he knew very well that the Russian winter would have halted any German offensive. His frontline generals, however, like von Bock, Hoth and Guderian, convinced him that, the attack, that an attack against Moscow was still possible before winter. Their reports, coupled with completely erroneous intelligence report, indicating that the Soviets were almost out of, of reserves, induced Hitler to allow the OKW to plan the offensive against Moscow, codenamed Operation Typhoon. Yet, just like Barbarossa, Typhoon was about to start in very disadvantageous conditions. Three months of uninterrupted fighting had worn out the attacking divisions in Army Group Center. The 49 infantry divisions had between 75 and 80 percent of their initial strength in manpower, and the same numbers can be applied to the panzers of the 3rd and 4th panzer groups. Guderian stressed to Kiev and the subsequent redeployment of his, of his units, however, further increased the toll on the panzer divisions, and by the start of Typhoon, their combat strength was around 50%. And if all of this was not enough, Army Group Center's logistics was its Achilles heel. Difficulties in restoring the railway lines and bottlenecks in the supply pipelines meant that Army Group Center would have attacked with less than one-third of the required equipment. The last German offensive began on the morning of September the 30th, when Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group stroke in the, in the direction of Bryansk. Two days later, also the 3rd and 4th Panzer Group attacked the Russian positions. The attackers caught the Soviet troops completely by, su by surprise, as the Stavka assumed that the Germans would have not attacked anymore with the winter at the gates. Facing ill-equipped and badly trained units, once more the German Panzer's division rushed forward and within one week, they encircled the Soviet forces into the Piesma and Bryansk pockets. As the infantry of Army Group Center was gradually wiping out the pockets, the German High Command once more changed the original plan of Operation Typhoon by diverting forces of the 3rd Panzer Group toward Kalinin and part of Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group toward Kursk. This dilution of forces reduced Army Group Center's main effort toward Moscow and further increased logistics difficulties. Day after day, the weather conditions worsened and, with them, the infra infrastructures. The dirty and dusty roads with the first autumn rains became rivers of mud, mortal traps for the horse-drawn artillery and the motorized vehicles of the supply columns. The fuel situation was so critical that on October the 24th, Army Group Center's advance was halted. It resumed on November the 13th, 
when the ground froze and supply began to flow in again. At this time, however, armor group's center simply did not have the strength to carry on the offensive. The advance was low due to the freezing weather and to the newly arrived Soviet reserves brought to Moscow from every, co from every corner of the Soviet Union. By December the 5th, the situation on the Eastern Front looked like this, with the German advance formations less than 50 kilometers away from Moscow. That very same day, the Soviets started their counter-offensive, which will force the Germans to retreat to positions that, that were more defendable. Two days later, the Empire of Japan attacked the US Pacific Fleet, turning the war into a global conflict. Hitler, completely ignoring the enormous industrial potential of the US, declared war against them on December the 11th. So, to conclude, if in 1940, by letting escape the British from Dunkirk, Hitler lost the chance to end the war in Europe, then, by attacking with an extreme delay the Soviet Union, he opened a two-front war, and with that declaration of war, Germany embarked upon the titanic war of, attr war of attrition, which would have culminated with the collapse of the Third Reich in the following four years.